study in uh, the Gospel of John, and we are in uh, John uh, chapter 7 at the uh, Feast of Tabernacles where the Lord is teaching, and we've spent last week and we're going to spend this week uh, talking about the Spirit of God. Uh, in response to this statement that he made in uh, verse 37 and through 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus has come uh, into this world uh, to save sinners. He has come into this world to pay for the sins of man. He has come into this world uh, to die as an atonement or a satisfaction or a payment for our sins. And because of his work, because of what he accomplishes, God can extend mercy and grace to us and offer us forgiveness, offer us eternal life, offer us the hope of heaven, and literally offer us himself. So Jesus, all through his ministry, continually calls people to that reality. And over and over and over again, he gives evidence that he is who he claims to be. He gives evidence by the miracles he does. He gives evidence by the prophecies that he fulfills. He gives evidence by his perfect, sinless life. And he gives evidence by the wisdom that he speaks the amazing things that he says. But as we've seen, few come. It's a free gift. It's the answer to man and woman's greatest problem. It is the hope of a life after death. It is a free gift. And yet, few receive it. Because, Scripture says, people love their sin. But the process of salvation is a process that is initiated and carried out and consummated by our triune God. It is the plan of the Father, it is the Son who makes it possible, it is the Spirit who executes it. And for that reason, we are spending some time talking about the Spirit of God because Jesus said that if you come with a thirsty soul, it will be quenched by the Spirit of God, and you will be transformed, and out of your life will come all the blessedness of God himself as his love and his blessing flow out of you in your life and in your testimony, like the living water that you received to enter. So, we talk about the Spirit of God because uh, very seldom uh, does it seem the church talks about the Spirit of God. We talk about the reality that the Spirit of God is, in fact, the third member of the Trinity, that God is three in person and one in essence. We spent a lot of time on that, going through the scriptures. There's nothing inconsistent or illogical about that. It is difficult to understand, it is somewhat mysterious, but it is not beyond our understanding to this extent, and that is, the Bible is clear that it speaks of God as being one. He is one God. And we know that he is one God in his essence. By that, all the attributes that belong to God, that make him God, are his. and. He is three in the distinct persons who have those attributes. So they are one 
in attributes. They are three. He is three in person. So all of them are omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, holy, immutable. All of those amazing truths about God belong to those three distinct persons. And God is said, therefore, to be one, in essence, three in persons. Now, well, in addition to that, last time we talked about the Spirit's role in revelation. That is, it is by the Spirit that we have the Word of God and that we can understand it. Once again, remember, it is the Spirit of God who brings to the writers of Scripture the ability to put onto a piece of paper exactly the words that God wants penned by their own vocabularies, in their own wills, and based on their own histories and person. That process is called inspiration, and we looked at that last time. And then, the ability to understand his word, the ability to fully appreciate what God is revealing to us, comes by a process called illumination, and that too is by the work of the Spirit, who now indwells us and opens up our understanding to the Word. So the Spirit brings the revelation through the writers to the pages of Scripture, and then opens our eyes to allow us to understand it. The process of God's amazing revelation through His Scripture is supernatural at every turn. It is all supernatural. And we won't go down that trail, but that's why so many who claim to be scholars don't have a clue. <laughs> because they just can't understand it. Because apart from the Spirit of God, apart from being a believer, it is closed to them. Well, now let's uh, turn our attention a little bit to what the role of the Spirit of God is uh, in our life. How important is he to us, and what exactly does he do in and through and for us? Well, let's start with the basics. Let's go back to John 3. We're going to divide these, uh, these things that the Spirit of God does into two specific categories. One are the categories we'll call by his sovereign grace. In other words, these are the things the Spirit of God does in and for us that are the sovereign choice and actions of God. And then we're going to look at what the Spirit of God does for us as believers when we yield ourselves to him. One requires our action and the other does not, other than to come by faith uh, to him. But let's start with those, of so those sovereign actions that the Spirit, um, that the Spirit does uh, in us. It starts in John chapter 3, in verses 3 through 6. This is the dialogue that the Lord had with Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Being a Christian is not being religious. It is not doing some good things. It is not hanging around a church. It is not saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It is not giving your money. It is not religious activity or ministry. It is being born again. You must be born again. So when you run into these poor people that are going to churches and you ask them, are they Christians? And they say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those born again kind. Well, call yourself something else then. Call yourself anything. 
But don't call yourself a Christian because you aren't one, unless you are born again. Again, it is supernatural. <laughs> it is supernatural. It comes by the work of the Spirit in a life as you accept and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and turn from your sin. At that point, God regenerates you and gives you a new heart, a heart that can know Him and love Him and follow Him and understand Him and glorify Him. It is not a 12-step program to heaven. It is a new birth. And, as we continue here, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus, I think, being somewhat facetious, but again, talking in physical language and responding to Jesus' spiritual explanation of the reality of new birth. And then Jesus said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The birth is spiritual. It is spiritual. It is a spiritual birth. It comes by the Spirit. You must be born of the Spirit. What does the Spirit do for us? It births us. It regenerates us. It brings us into new life. And then in John 14... John 14, 16, and 17. Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. We talked about this last time. That word another is very important in the Greek language. There are different forms of the word another. Uh, it would be like, um, let's assume we're talking about a, um, a car. You could say you have a car, and, I, and then you're going to get another car. That's one word for another. The other is, you're going to get another car exactly like the car you have. That is the same make, model, color, engine, interior, down to the minutest, smallest scratch on the door. That's that another. And that's this another. <laughs> Another helper, that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. Remember, this is a hard concept for some Christian churches, this forever concept. I just want to show it to you again. It is the Spirit of God who comes to dwell with you forever. If you have new birth, you always have new birth. If you possess the Spirit of God, you always possess the Spirit of God. And even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Spirit of God comes to dwell in you. It's part of the new birth. It's part of the process of new life, of spiritual life that God grants to repentant sinners who simply believe in Christ. How, how much time do you spend thinking about that truth? Do, do you realize, and that's great, if you do, that's fantastic, do you realize that the God of the universe the God who created all things, the God who is eternal from forever, the God who spoke things into existence, the God who knows everything, the holy God came to live inside you. Came to live inside you. Perhaps the greatest thing that happened when you got saved, in addition to your being removed from the wrath of God, 
and granted all the blessedness that he has and will have for you forever. But the greatest thing is the reality that you and even me possess God himself. That is the reality of the Christian life. That you are not just new, you are the temple of God. It, it, it troubles me sometimes how trivial my thoughts are, how trivial my activities are, how trivial my pursuits are, how trivial the things I get upset about, how trivial when I think on the reality that God himself lives in me. Romans 8. <laughs> Romans 8 and verse 26. Romans 8, verse 26. <laughs> Likewise, the Spirit who helps in our weaknesses for we do not know we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Uh, the, the Spirit of God ushers us into new life. The Spirit of God in dwells us. The Spirit of God seals us, and the Spirit of God prays for us. What does this mean? Well, look. He says he prays with groanings that cannot be uttered. I know a lot of people that use that to talk about all kinds of strange things, right? All kinds of utterances and things. But I just want to call you. I, I'm a very simple person. I just want to call you to what the verse says. Can we read it one more time? Okay. Um, it says... Pray for us as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which, what? Cannot be uttered. Underline that. You cannot utter them. So that should get rid of a lot of stuff using that verse. I mean, you may want to go someplace else, but whatever we're talking about here, this is something going on within the Trinity. It's something going on between the Spirit of God and the Father. It's, it's something beyond us. And what is it? It is the Spirit of God praying for us when we don't know what to pray for. And how does that work out? Well, it's very simple. It really is. Um, just how omniscient are you? How omnipotent are you? I mean, just how far can you project yourself beyond this time and this space? You don't have a clue what's going on outside the door, and neither do I. You don't have any idea what God's plan is for you beyond the breath you just took. You, you can't see forward, and you can't see sideways. You don't know what's going on with your loved ones, with your neighbors, with all the people that you relate with and interrelate with. You don't understand what the thing that God is doing in your life, how it works itself out in your life over the next five years. Do you? Don't you see? We are such amazing little creatures. Now, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are amazing, right? I mean, we, the, the human being is an amazing creation. So I don't want to minimize that. But in the scope of a comparison to God, we are really little. Really little. And we don't have a lot of strength and a lot of wisdom. It, it, I, it, you know... 
sometimes you just look back on your life, right? for, you, for those of you who can remember back to the time you're not saved and how you live your life and you'd effectively be shaking your fist at God because you'd live your life any way you want to. And you just, I, I don't know about you, but I, go, I just shudder. I just shudder at what a fool I was for so many years. And today, I look around at the world and I say, Oi, they. I mean, what are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, who do you think you are? God prays for us. He loves you. He saved you. He changed you. He comes to dwell in you. He sealed you for heaven. And he cares about you. And so, the Trinity prays for you and prays with you in the things that you desire. God desires you to pray, and you pray based upon what you understand, and you pray in conformance to what the Word of God says. We've talked a lot about that and talked a lot about that, and it's such a privilege to pray. And pray the simple prayers, and pray the longer prayers, and pray the short prayers, and pray prayers when you're standing up, and pray prayers when you're sitting down. Pray prayers on your face. Pray prayers in the morning. Pray prayers in the middle of the day, in the evening, at night. Just pray all the time, because that's what God says. Pray. Just talk to Him. He wants to talk to you. And then realize that the Spirit of God will help you. And pray for the things that you don't even know you need to be praying for. <laughs> because you belong to Him. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, But the one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individual as he wills. This whole section is on spiritual gifts. The Spirit of God gives you a gift. It gives you a, a gift that's unique to you. It comes at the time that you are saved. It is a supernatural enablement that God gives to you. So that you can edify the body of Christ. So that you can care for people. And you can be part of what God is doing in and through his church and in his kingdom. He gives you, uh, he gives you the gift of giving. That's a gift. People get all whacked out on spiritual gifts, right? And, and everybody, some people say, you've got to pray for this gift, and pray for that gift so you can get that gift. And, no, no, no. He, says he, gives it, right? he gives it as he will. You get the gifts you're going to get when you get saved. But one of the things that really kind of just makes me smile is I just have never heard anybody pray, Oh, God, please give me the gift of giving. How come? What a great gift. Or um, helps, counseling, administration, teaching, serving, hospitality, all kinds of gifts. Now, there are also sign gifts. We're not going to get into that. We've already talked through that before. Sign gifts to substantiate uh, the Word of God, I believe, in the first century uh, post-Christ. Uh, miraculous gifts to say God is doing something different and unique. And, and prior to the completion of his revelation, uh, he used those gifts in very amazing ways. Uh, and I, I don't want to—I I don't want to get dragged off into that discussion. That—that that was for another time. I, I just want you to know that the Spirit of God gives you gifts, and so as believers, as Christians, you should give some thought to what your giftedness is. Um, you know, there's some people that give tests to determine what your giftedness is and all that stuff. I, I don't know that it's—again, I'm not trying to be funny here. Okay. <laughs> I, I would like to suggest to you, I would like to suggest to you that um, that your gifts will become abundantly clear to you when you get up out of your chair and do something. Just go do something.
just start doing something. It's all kind of doing something for the kingdom. I mean, I mean, I, I'm not saying go out in the street and spin around in a circle ten times. I'm saying, I'm saying, look, there's all kinds of things that that you have in the church. I mean, you, there's so many ministries in this church. We are just so blessed. So many places to go to serve, and all kinds of people that would love to have you serve. And I know most of you folks are. So I'm 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 kind of preaching to the choir here. But the idea here is you just go. And you minister, and the more you go and minister, the more you're going to see God do amazing things in the areas that you're gifted. And you're going to sense a real fulfillment in those areas because they're so important to you, and because God uses you in such a unique and powerful way. Everybody's gift is different. Everybody's gift is unique, and 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 there's sometimes a multiplicity of gifts that you have in your one gift. It isn't just one unique thing. <coughs> Excuse me. For instance, I give you an example: the gift of teaching. You know, some people have the gift of teaching to, like Billy Graham. I mean, you go, you you speak to huge crowds. Uh, some people have the gift of teaching uh, with kindergartners in, in a kindergarten class. You know, and all the varieties of, of teaching and giftedness uh, in between. Some people uh, teach. In, uh, more didactically, some pe people teach more with illustrations. Is it, is it, how that gift works itself out is between you and God as you yield yourself up to His Spirit. Anyway, all of that to say, we have now looked at. I, I did skip over one that I, that I, I, we won't look up, but that is in Ephesians 1:13, where where the Spirit of God seals us unto redemption. That's really important. Again. The Spirit of God is the guarantee that you're saved and you're going to stay saved and you're going to go to heaven. That, that's, that's his ministry. So, look, so, so he, sa he saves us as we submit ourselves to Christ and the truth. He indwells us. He seals us. He prays for us. He gifts us. All of those things, all of those things, he does. He, he just does that for us. Uh, irrespective of what we do after we submit our lives to Christ and believe in Him. And then, there's a series of things that He does in and through us that require us to do something. We must do something. So let's look at a couple of them. Go with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Have we got a GE Power Company down now? Okay. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay. Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The key relationship that we have with the Spirit of God who indwells us is who is in control. Who is in control. What God says is, you possess the Spirit, but now you must yield yourself to the Spirit and let the Spirit fill you. Filling is just another word for control. It's not an ecstatic experience. It is whether or not you are living your life under the control of the Spirit of God. And there are different manifestations to that to let you determine whether you are. We just read some. If you are filled under the control of the Spirit of God, you are joyful, singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. A filling by the Spirit of God brings joy to a life or thankfulness. You are thankful always or submissive. You are a submissive person. When you are filled with the Spirit of God and He controls you, you look like Jesus. You look like Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says that the Spirit of God 
will empower you to live and to witness. When you find yourself desiring to talk about Jesus, when you find your, your life a flowing and a loving obedience to Christ, then you are under the control of the Spirit of God, and He gives you the strength and the power. We've talked about this before. Some of the greatest experiences you can have is to go out into ministry where you are absolutely uncomfortable and powerless. Right? Don't kiss me, Lord. I don't know anything. I don't want to go there. Uh, that, that is, I told you, that's exactly how I got in prison ministry. Just I'll go any place but there, Lord. That was 27 years ago or something. And, you know, Bob Collins and I and a bunch of others, uh, some of us are, um, are here, go to prison each week, and it's just been a blessing. But it didn't happen because I was qualified or even willing. It happened because the Spirit of God had control of my life, and he blessed me in an amazing way. So we are empowered when we are filled. The other thing that's happened happen is we will bear fruit, Galatians 5, 12, <clears throat> when we are filled. <clears throat> very important, <clears throat> very important scripture. Obviously, they all are, 5, 12. I hope you understand that this... Uh, this Christian life, as we keep going through this, it is an amazing real, a spiritual reality, but it's not mystical. It, it, God gives us very practical instructions on how to live our lives uh, as we yield ourselves to the Spirit. So in 5.18, he says what? Uh, I'm sorry, 5.22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. You know that, right? You all know that. Self-control. Okay? That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. That When you are filled with the Spirit of God, when you are under His control, this is what your life looks like. Love and joy, peace. We usually stop there. You know, people run out. You can you forget. You, know, you kind of run out. Yeah, but, but the next ones are really good. Long suffering. That's, that's a good word for patient. How's that? How are you doing? Uh, or kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. How about this one? Self control. That's a good one. We don't talk much about that. So here, here's the here's the uh, here's the magical question. How do you know whether you're filled by the Spirit? Oh, no, I got my hands aren't high enough. They're not low enough. No, I, I can't be, I must not be filled with the Spirit. I'm, I'm on a roll today. I don't know what's wrong with me. This is crazy. I'm filled with the Spirit. <laughs> so how do you know if you're filled with the Spirit? Come on now. Well, I, I didn't say that. How, how do you know whether you're filled with the Spirit? Well, yeah, just go back through these. Just go back through these and, and, and ask yourself, how am I doing? Better yet, have your wife or your friends. That... <laughs> how are you doing? I mean, are, are you a, are you a loving person? Are, are you are you a joyful person? Uh, do you have a lot of peace in your life? Uh, are you patient with people and circumstances? Are, are, are you kind? Are you kind? I, I, that, that would always, uh, I always stumble on that. I mean, I, I know so, there are so many people that struggle in marriage relationships, and, and I just kind of go, oh, just, if you were as kind to your friends as you are to your spouse, you wouldn't have any problems. <laughs> Oh, that's a faithful gentleness. Are you gentle? Do you, are you have self-control? I mean, that, that's how you know. Anytime you lack these things, anytime in your life you find yourself angry, bitter. Uh, let's see, that's, the Christian word is frustrated. Uh, <laughs> impatient. Uh, anytime you find yourself in sin, gossiping, envying, stealing. Anytime you're doing any of those kinds of things, you are not filled with the Spirit. Therefore, the Spirit does not 
control you. Therefore, you have no power in your life. And you cannot experience what he wants you to experience in his peace and his joy and his love when you are in the process of quenching the spirit, which is what, um, which is the one of the two things that, that the Word of God talks about not doing with the spirit. One is do not quench him and do not grieve him. Don't do what he doesn't want you to do and do what he wants you to do. That, that's what that means. Okay. What else does the Spirit do for you? Look at this. In 2nd in Second Corinthians 3.18. It says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You have come into this new relationship with the triune God. You have been born again, and now you have entered into the adventure of spiritual life. And the adventure of spiritual life is lived under the control, the leading and the guiding and the power of the Spirit of God. And as you yield yourself, which is required for Him to work, then and only then will you see your life changed into the likeness of Christ. It's called the process of spiritual maturity or sanctification. It is the process that God uses to bring us from new birth to Christ's likeness. And he uses, he uses the Word of God and he uses the circumstances of our life to change us and conform us into the image of his son. It's only done by the Spirit of God. He sanctifies us. In John 16, 3, he guides us. He leads and guides us. Know something. The Spirit of God, when you're under his control, will lead you only toward Christ. He will lead you only toward holiness. He will lead you only in conformance with the Word. I don't care how you feel about something. I don't care what it seems like. That is where you get deceived. And God doesn't want you deceived. He will only lead you into truth. And truth conforms to His Word. I want to come back to that in just a second. The other thing he does in Acts 9.31 is to comfort us. It is the Spirit of God who gives us comfort in the middle of our trials, in the middle of tribulations, in the middle of persecutions, in the middle of the hard things of life. And believe me, the fact that you've come into a relationship with Christ does not guarantee that the world will all be happy, wonderful, sweet, without trials. It guarantees you the opposite. <laughs> Yeah, it gives you the opposite. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So you've got a cursed world you're living in. There's a whole bunch of sinners around you. And guess what? If you look like Jesus, they're going to treat you like they treated Jesus. And that's not good. But that's okay. Because that's for the glory of God. Well, the Spirit is absolutely essential to the Christian life. It is a travesty to trivialize the things of the Spirit. To look at all the foolish little things that people say the Spirit is doing is just silly when you focus on who He is and what He does and how we need Him to live our life. He is absolutely essential. Nothing can be done for the glory of God apart from the Spirit of God. So if you are quenching the Spirit of God in your life, you are shutting down what God wants to do for His glory through you. 
it is um, it is an amazing privilege to know the Spirit of God and to possess Him in your life. Let me show you one last practical thing which we've talked about before. We looked at Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Spirit. That's key. Under His control. And the manifestations of that? Singing, joy, thankfulness, submission. And by the way, if you continue through Ephesians, husbands treat your wives the way you're supposed to, wives treat your husbands the way you're supposed to, kids respond to your parents the way you're supposed to, workers respond to your workers, uh, bosses respond to your workers the way you're supposed to, workers respond to your boss. That's what, that's what all the rest of that section is. It's an expectation of Christian living. It's only done when you're filled with the Spirit of God. Do you understand that? Apart from that, you're just like a religious person. If you're trying to be a good person apart from the Spirit of God, it is not God in you working out and through you. It is you trying to gut it up Pull up your bootstraps, grit your teeth, and be a good person. Now that, 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 there's no glory to God in that. You, you don't know it. And look at this. So that's what Ephesians 5.18 says. Now we go to this parallel passage, which we've done a number of times, but we just keep doing it because you're going to remember it eventually. Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16. Remember Ephesians 5.18, right? Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in Psalms and hymns. Remember that? Got it? Okay, now let's read Colossians. Let the word of Christ, Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And it goes on in the same form as Ephesians in terms of exhortation for a Christian living. So, the, what, this is, what this is called is a biblical equivalency. That is, because the result of doing two different things is the same, then the things that are listed are the same. There, there's an equivalency. Are you with me? So, in one case you're called to be filled with the Spirit, and in the other case you're called to what? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Well, how does that work? I mean, I, I, you know, I'm all into mystical spirit feelings and stuff. No, 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 that isn't how it works. Look, <clears throat> the Spirit of God fills you when you're under His control, when you're doing the things that He tells you to do. That is contained in the Word of God, which does make sense, doesn't it? Because we spent all that time explaining that He is the author of the Word of God. It's come by Him through the authors, and is open to you because he lives in you. So if you want to know what the Spirit of God wants you to do when you're under his control, you have to look at the Word of God. He's the author of it. Right? So, you have to yield to him, and you have to put this in. Because as you intake the Word of God and you understand what God says, the Spirit of God can move on you and move you toward obedience as you yield yourself toward Him and take you the places He wants you to go and avoid the places He doesn't want you to go. And you can understand the things of life. You can understand trials. You can understand persecutions. You can understand what God is working out and in and through your life because you understand the principles and you understand the specifics of the Word of God. That's what the Spirit of God will use in your life. The Spirit of God? How important is He? Really important. Oh, and by the way, He doesn't rain down. He's in you. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for our time together. And what a joy. What, what, a, what a blessedness to to just focus uh, on uh, you, uh, uh, Spirit, you, Holy Spirit, who have done so much for us and continue to do everything for us, Lord, in our uh, Christian life. Help us, Father, to just uh, yield ourselves to you, uh, just uh, submit ourselves to your leading and guiding. Seek to never quench or grieve you and to... Uh, and to give Christ all the glory because of you who have made it all possible. Thank you, Jesus. What a joy it is to open your word. In your name we pray.